Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this presentation from the Theosophical Society in America. My name is John Chianciosi. I'm the Director of Public Programs, and I am happy to be with you this evening. The Theosophical Society promotes study, meditation, and service. We encourage open-minded inquiry into the world religions, philosophy, science, and the arts, and we have a deep respect for the unity of all life. Our goal is to help people explore the spiritual path so as to arrive at a deeper understanding regarding the wisdom of the ages. Furthermore, we feel that this wisdom is not limited to any one tradition, and thus we offer programs from all traditions. I do encourage you to visit our website, scroll down on the programs, and there you'll find a full listing of the current programs being offered. I'm sure that you'll find some, if not many, to be of interest to you. One in particular that I wish to mention this evening is the online program Investigating Collective Consciousness at the Global Scale with Dean Radin, and it will be on Saturday, October 1st, from 1 to 2.30 p.m. In this interactive workshop, Dr. Dean Radin, who is the chief scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, will present findings of the latest scientific research in this fascinating study, followed by an extensive Q&A and discussion with participants. I do hope you can join us for that workshop. Now, for this evening's presentation, we have Dr. Ruben Lokanen, who is an assistant professor at Southern Cross University in Australia. And he also holds an honorary fellowship at the University of Queensland. Ruben's research aims to uncover empirically grounded and experientially authentic models of meditation, insight, and non-duality. Using a combination of methods including behavior, neuroimaging, machine learning, and phenomenology, he is investigating some of the rarest states of awareness available to human beings. Ruben's research is deeply theoretically driven and tra traverses multiple levels of explanations, from neurons to psychology. He has published many articles in leading journals and speaks regularly on the international conferences. Ruben has an eclectic con contemplative background and has studied Zen, Advaita, and Theravada Buddhism. Tonight, he will speak on the true nature of now, meditation, and the predictive brain. I hope you enjoy this presentation. Welcome to my talk. Uh, it's titled The True Nature of Now, Meditation and the Predictive Brain. My name is Dr. Ruben Laukonen. I'm a lecturer or an assistant professor at Southern Cross University here on the uh, Gold Coast of, uh, of Australia. Um, and a lot of the research work that I'm going to be just discussing now was also conducted during my postdoctoral work at uh, the Fry University of Amsterdam. Uh, and so I'm going to be talking about our unifying uh, perspective on meditation from the perspective of the predictive brain and also um, going a few steps beyond that into the domains of um, things like non-dual awareness, uh, cessation, and all of these really uh, deep experiences that contemplatives have talked about for thousands of years that I think may for the first time begin to make sense given what we know about the, um, the mind, the brain, and the, the organism in general based on these new, new ideas. So what's so special about the predictive brain? So for those who haven't heard of what the predictive brain is, the predictive brain is the first real satisfying, I think, unifying account of um, how the mind, the brain, and the organism work. And it's, it proposes to explain everything that we experience, including our thoughts, our emotions, our relationships, our deepest insight experiences, 
um, our movements, our actions, all from this from these basic axioms, these simple, relatively simple principles that can be applied throughout all of our experiences to, to understand them in a completely new way. Um, but in a way that's uh, really promising, uh, especially for contemplative practice. And what's special about the predictive brain for me is that about 12 years ago, I started to undergo a lot of the um, uh, experiences that I'm about to describe to you. Um, and so I was, I was also practicing meditation and, and going on retreats um, and doing other things to explore my mind and consciousness. And in doing that, I, I tasted some of these deeper things. But I was also studying psychology. I was also learning about neuroscience and how the brain works. And I went on to do a PhD and so on. And what I found during that time, this is before predictive processing ideas, active inference, these new ideas came about, I had this deep feeling that the way that we understood the mind in the West just wasn't satisfying enough. It wasn't going deep enough to touch the kinds of experiences I was personally having and all these people around me were, were having in a really reliable, uh, replicable way, given certain uh, uh, practices of the mind. I felt that these siloed models of, of cognition and emotion and attention, they just, they just didn't capture the depth of what we're capable of experiencing and the various spectrum, the huge spectrum of consciousness possible to, to human beings. But that all changed during my PhD when, when these new, new ideas came about. For the first time, I felt when I was learning about them that my experience uh, made sense in light of a contemporary uh, neuroscientific model. And it made better sense than what I was reading in the old texts of Buddhism and Hinduism and Taoism and other, uh, other mystical traditions. Up until then, it didn't. But now, it, suddenly, it, was, um, it seemed to better capture my experience. But the best part is not only did it capture my experience, it was the best explanation for the data that I had seen to date. Um, for the data that was out there, you know, thousands and thousands of uh, cognitive studies, neuroscience studies, perceptual studies, um, made much better sense in light of this model. So that's what's special about the predictive brain, and I'm going to tell you uh, about that. But my goal for this talk is to really keep things quite big picture general. So it doesn't matter who you are, you should be able to understand this talk. If you're a scientist listening to this talk, you might find that it's a bit lighter than other talks I've given. And if you want to see the details, you've got to see that you've got to read the published literature, um, what we've written, and I'll, I'll show you what paper we'll be uh, drawing on. Um, but my goal for this talk is to really give an overview, an overview of the different meditation techniques, an overview of how um, these meditation techniques uh, uh, affect predictive processing. And hopefully, through that process, allow us to make sense in a scientific way of some of the deepest experiences that humans uh, experience can, can undergo in the process of a contemplative path and, and otherwise. Now, I want to say just one thing before I start about the power of concepts. So in many meditation traditions, many contemplative traditions, and, in, and perhaps in spirituality in general, there's this sense that we have to drop concepts, and concepts are bad, and we've got to get rid of them. And, you know, at some phases and in, in, in the actual practice of these things, uh, that's, that's true. You know, we do need to um, let go of our concepts at a certain point to move deeper. But the thing is that to exist in this world, we know from the science that Essentially, all of experience draws on conceptuality. To experience anything um, has some conceptuality uh, associated with it in the sense that there is a process of interpretation that happens uh, whenever we experience anything at all. And that interpretation happens based on our past experience, and you'll see that. And so it's a kind of conceptuality. So to exist in this world, we rely on concepts to some extent. So having good concepts is really valuable. And I can't tell you how many people that have come up to me after reading this scientific paper about meditation who have said that their meditation practice has improved. That completely surprised me, was not the intention um, of, this, of this work, but it's, it fascinates me that when you have the right concepts that perhaps that actually allows the mind to relax into, you know, trusting that they're doing something that's worthwhile because they're seeing it clearly. So the paper that I'm talking about here is this one. 
Um, it's called From Many to None, Meditation and the Plasticity of the Predictive Mind. Now, this is a paper that I wrote with uh, Professor Helene Slagter. So all the ideas associated with this paper were very much a um, uh, work that involved both of us in collaboration. So um, a lot of credit to her, a lot of credit to many other people who have helped um, me make sense of these ideas and also to uh, contemplative teachers who have helped me go through some of these experiences. Um, so this was published in Neuroscience and Biobehavioral Reviews uh, last year. So again, if you want the scientific details, you've got to really read the paper, but I'm going to try to give the overview here. So what we're going to um, discuss is first uh, levels of meditation. Usually I start with the predictive brain, but today I'm going to start with levels of, of meditation. Um, and then I'm going to introduce the predictive brain, then the theory of how this all comes together, and then I'm going to get into a bit of a um, fresh domain, get a little bit philosophical, a little bit deep, and really talk about this idea of non-duality and non-dual awareness and how it's possible that something like that um, can exist in, in everyday life from a scientific perspective. So stay tuned for that. Um, okay, beginning with levels of meditation. So I'm dr drawing on uh, particularly three levels of meditation that are broad categories, broad umbrella categories that have been derived from the cognitive neuroscience. So as scientists, we want to try to make sense of this broad field of contemplative practice and try to put them in categories that we can then study rigorously in the lab. And so that's the goal with these three core styles of meditation. And this is something that's used by many um, researchers in the field to understand um, how to study these practices. Now, the first is focused attention. This is what most people start with when they start a meditation practice. When you first go to a teacher or you watch a um, guided meditation on YouTube, this is usually where it all, almost always begins. Now, in this technique, you take a meditation posture, whatever it is, and you guide your attention to one object of focus. Okay, that can be some part of your body, any part of the body. It could be your breath. It could be a mantra. And whenever thoughts arise, cognitions, um, uh, mind wandering arises, we, rec we, we simply bring our attention back to that one point of, of attention, that one object of attention. So this includes meditations like breathing exercises, focusing on the breath, some forms of the early stages of yoga where you're paying attention to your posture in different um, uh, practices, mantra recitation, uh, meta practices, loving kindness practices in some forms, and for example, also prayer. So anything where you're focusing on one object of attention to the exclusion of others. Now, the next stage of, of meditation is called open monitoring. Now, in this phase of meditation, instead of having a specific focus, um, and sometimes you can have a specific focus, but also have this more open lens. So here, the, the scope of attention is opened up to include anything that arises in our experience. So this could be um, sights if you are meditating with your eyes open, um, it could be sounds, it could be thoughts, but whatever arises in your awareness is simply allowed to arise, is noticed, and then the attention is brought back to this open scope of awareness, especially if, if the mind wandering captures um, attention again. So the emphasis here now is this non-preferential, um, non-judgmental, open and relaxed form of awareness towards anything that's uh, being experienced. So this includes, for example, mindfulness practice, vipassana or insight practices, some forms of labeling our experience practices like in the Mahasi Sayadaw tradition. And there's an emphasis on being meta aware of our experience of being relaxed and open to whatever arises. Okay, so there's this not strict focus of attention, but often you need that initial focus of attention in order to be able to relax into this openness without being caught in mind wandering. So there's this progression that can be helpful. So here it gets a little bit trickier and we're talking about non-dual meditations. Sorry about my giant uh, teacup here. So in the non-dual meditation, it gets much harder to provide an instruction because as you know, in, as I mentioned, in the open monitoring, there's still an awareness of something out there. There's still sort of this putting the attention out to anything that arises um, in our experience in, in open monitoring. But in non-dual, we even release experience. So you're even dropping the tendency of 
attention itself of observing anything whatsoever. No thoughts, no sensations, no mind, just being empty, open awareness. And so we're dropping the attention into the source of the mind itself. It's very hard to give instructions for this because it's a non-meditation. It's a non-doing. It's an emptying. It's a letting go of the sense that there's a subject observing any object whatsoever. It's simply letting the mind rest into what already is. This includes practices like shikantaza in the Zen tradition. Self-inquiry can be used in, for example, Advaita Vedanta or uh, some other practices in Zen as well, where we uh, question the, uh, this, this very existence of this observer. Uh, Murakaba in the Sufi tradition and quintessentially Mahamudra and Dzogchen from uh, Tibetan Buddhism. I want to give you a few quotes because this is a really ancient practice. It all practically goes back to the dawn of written history. So Ashtavakra Gita is a very old example. And here, here it says, set your body aside, sit in your own awareness, meditate on the self, one without two. Uh, in meditation, he does not meditate. So there's no sense that anybody's doing anything anymore. And this is from the Zen tradition. Silent illumination involves withdrawal from exclusive focus on a particular sensory or mental object to allow intent apprehension of all phenomena as a unified totality. This is somewhere between open monitoring and non-dual, the pure kind of non-dual practice. From the Tibetan tradition, do not pursue the past, do not usher in the future, rest evenly within present awareness, clear and non-conceptual. Now, there's something about this non-dual practice that is a deeper into the present moment, deeper into the here and now than those other stages of practice. We often think of the here and now as our sensory experience. But as you'll see in this talk, even sensory experience is derived from the past. And so to go deeper into the here and now, we really need to rest in present, something deeper in the present than that. Sri Tilopa said, if mind has no aim, it is Mahamudra. You will discover the path of Buddha when there is no path of meditation. By meditating on non-meditation, you will attain the supreme. Again, emphasizing this idea that eventually we must let go of even the idea of meditation in order to practice non-dual awareness. And in the most simplest description I've seen yet, it's been called wakefulness beyond accepting and rejecting. Now, this idea of an awareness that precedes all the contents of our mind, all the consciousness, all the thoughts, all of the mind, even has some roots in, in, psycho in contemporary psychology. So um, William James is considered one of the forefathers of psychology. Many of the things we study were basically defined by him. Um, and in 1890, William James coined the term chusness, which he described as an awareness preceding consciousness that is without subject or object. Now, William James was a bit of a psychonaut, so he liked to do all kinds of experiments with his mind, especially with nitrous oxide. And so James also described an experience he called the syncope during inhalation of nitrous oxide. He said, during the syncope, there is absolute psychic annihilation the absence of all consciousness. Then at the beginning of coming to, one has at a certain moment a vague, limitless, infinite feeling, a sense of existence in general without the least trace of a distinction between the me and the not me. No distinction between the subject and the object, just like these other quotes were describing. This time though, drug-induced so could be a little bit different. Now, the last thing I want to introduce you to, and I don't know how much time I'll have to go into this in detail, but it's something that's very fascinating. Um, and it's something we're doing, um, ex we've done experiments on actually, and we're analyzing the data now. So we'll have some papers out about this soon. And it's called Naroda Samapati, which roughly translates to cessation attainment. It's, it's a very advanced um, um, state in meditation where even awareness, even consciousness is from within turned off. So even that sense of a non-dual awareness, of an empty awareness without subject or object, that sense of existence in general, that groundless ground is even absent in this Nirodha Samapati. Total absence or cessation of consciousness, no awareness, and it's comparable to general anesthesia or hibernation. 
Now, that's really interesting. And it's not a goal of meditation itself, but it's interesting for what one discovers as the mind reconstructs itself. It's what happens in the moments after this absence of consciousness that meditators consider to be important and, and can provide insight into how the mind works. Here's just a few quotes from the old Buddhist uh, suttas about Nirodha Samapati. It says, the Kamaguna Sutta says that that sphere should be understood where the eye ceases and perception of forms fades away. That sphere should be understood where the ear ceases and the perception of sounds fades away. That sphere should be understood where the nose and smells, tongue and taste, body and perception of tactile objects fades away. That sphere should be understood where the mind ceases and perception of mental phenomena fades away, where it's all gone. No sense of time ever passing, no sense of space, no sense of self, nothing gone. The Cosmos Loka Sutta says that I say that the end of world cannot be known, seen, or reached by traveling. Yet I also say that without reaching the end of the world, there is no making an end to dukkha or dissatisfaction or suffering. So those are the levels of meditation that I wanted to describe. So this is the process of deconstructive meditation. Now there's a whole, these forms of meditation that happen after that, for example, Tantra or the reconstructive practices of the mind, the way that we make ourselves more compassionate and better people in the world. All these are really, really important, but we're talking about the deconstructive stages of meditation. The next stage of, of our research is working out within this same framework, how the mind reconstructs itself. Okay, moving on to the predictive brain. So what's special about the predictive brain, as I said? Now, there's a big shift that the predictive brain made about our understanding of how all of our experiences developed. The old view of how the brain generates experience was that we take in experience from the world. So if you imagine that there's these things around us and gradually... Um, from the raw sensory data, the impressions on our skin or the, uh, the light on our retina or the vibrations in our ears or the molecules in our noses are interpreted into, are, are changed in electrical signals, which are then slowly build up our model of, the, of, of reality from the outside in. You know, that might be the impression you have about how the mind works. Predictive processing flips this on its head and instead tells us that what we, everything that we experience, our perceptions, our emotions, our embodied experiences, our thoughts, our relationships, everything that this moment is made out of, every level of abstraction is built up from within. We actually simulate it from within. We create this moment from within. So the mind becomes much more, the brain, the organism becomes much more active, much more creative than passive, much more generative. It's creating this experience based on past experience, based on what this moment ought to look like given what has been seen uh, before. And so you can see how perception is, is driven by past experience with many of the illusions that uh, scientists can now create. We're very good at making these because once you know how the perceptual system works, you can manipulate it and you make, can make illusions happen. You see many of these going viral online. So this is called the hollow mask illusion and it's hollow. But what our perception does when we see the other side of this hollow mask, it actually flips it so that it doesn't look hollow anymore. And this is because um, what is done here is a manipulation of light and our experience with faces that gives rise to a prediction of what this looks like rather than what's actually there. What it should look like given our past experiences leads to a visual illusion. There's many, many examples of this. So you can see how past experience drives perception firsthand in many, many ways. Everything we perceive is a construction based on past experience. Now, why is this? Why does the brain do this? And the answer is that the brain faces a fundamental problem. And that fundamental problem is that it has no direct access to the outside world. It has to convene, converse, relate to the world through the boundaries of our body. And it's only through the boundaries of the body that the brain receives electrical signals. And then the brain has the computing power to actually generate that into a rich uh, experience. So it only has these electrical signals to deal with, and it has to interact with the world through the bounds of the body. And so the brain is in a kind of box, a kind of proverbial box that is the body, and the world outside has no way of actually getting in that box. And so what that means is that the brain has to generate, the brain, the body, the whole system has to generate a model of the world from within. 
It has to generate this experience because this experience has no way of actually getting in from the outside, so we have to make it up ourselves. But how does the brain generate a practical model of our reality while stuck inside this box? By making predictions. So here's how it works. The brain makes predictions about what is out there in the world, and then it gets feedback through the electrical signals derived from our sensory systems and the form of errors, and then it updates those predictions in order to get a better prediction. Very simple. So now the brain doesn't have to take in the whole world. It only needs to take in the errors that it makes so it can rely on its simulation, which is much more computationally efficient for the brain to do. And by making these predictions over millions of years of evolution and our developmental um, trajectory as well, we get very good at making these predictions of simulating um, these present moments and our uh, thoughts and our projections. We get better and better at doing that. Now, it's never perfect. We still always have this experience. We see something out of the corner of our eye. We look over there and actually it's something completely different. Or we see someone in the crowd that we think is our friend. It's not them. We hear something that never happened. And in the worst case, we can experience complete delusions. Um, so these predictive systems can go haywire. Every predictive system, every part of the system can go wrong and has gone wrong. There's an example of a psychiatric illness, a trauma, or something that has broken down that system. It is all vulnerable to break down, and it's all a process of inference that, again, can be, can be manipulated in the lab in all sorts of ways. So we, by generating this model over and over again, it starts to slowly approximate the world enough to be adaptive for survival. It is tuned for fitness, for survival, not for fidelity, not for truth, not for accuracy, but for survival. So the brain faces this fundamental problem and it resolves it by minimizing prediction errors. That's the essence of it. It's all just minimizing prediction errors, uncertainty, um, entropy. That's what these prediction errors are over the time. Now, really important to know is that the way that the brain constructs this reality is hierarchical because we're not just dealing with the present sens sensory systems, not just that. We have categorizations. We have giant teacups that we also have to perceive as separate from the environment. We have to categorize and understand that this teacup can hold tea and then you can drink that tea. We have to understand all of these things. And the way that this is understood is a process of hierarchical abstraction. So that means this, this predictive processing happens on multiple levels of the brain. That's why the brain is so complicated and folded on top of itself and has many layers because that helps it deal with these many levels of abstraction. And so this predictive processing, prediction error minimization is happening at all of these levels um, of the mind, ranging from the concrete experience of awareness and sensory experience all the way up to our high-level thinking, our thoughts and narratives. And we, we call this um, process of abstraction a range from concrete to abstract, okay? And so there's many examples to, to demonstrate that there's this process of abstraction happening and it's called also called temporal depth because it's a process of time. It happens in time. So the early levels happen early in time. A few milliseconds later, you get the later stages of time. This is one of my meditation participants. And here we, we collect, for example, event-related potentials using electroencephalography, which is all these electrodes on the brain. We present a stimulus, and that stimulus le leads to a response in time in the brain. Now, early responses are those initial impressions of that sensory response. Then you get um, task-dependent categorization. So you get the categorization. So you separate the teacup from the world, or you see it as a teacup. Then you have um, possible responses to that teacup, and then you also have all our linguistic and emotional and thinking responses to that teacup. And you can see this in time um, based on the ERP, just as one example. And you can get, get the same results with neuroimaging in terms of fMRI, um, uh, MEG, all of these other um, systems. Now, many studies point to this. One study used looked at one quarter of the whole fMRI literature and using machine learning algorithms derived a data-driven objective structure of cognition by showing that there is this progression of um, abstraction. And this wasn't human categorization. This was data-driven categorization all the way from our basic vibrotactile experience, the basic sensation to reasoning, naming concepts and language. 
And what they derived was essential an objective hierarchical landscape of cognition in the brain with awareness at its structural core and all results defined solely by computational, computational analysis largely devoid of human bias. Now, there's, there's a study basically in every journal that uh, we care about as, as scientists mapping out this process of abstraction in the brain. I think it's one of the most stable, solid, um, overarching results that we, we know about. And you can see it very nicely with language. So, for example, when you hear me, me, me talk, first your brain has to um, get the, 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 the precise sounds of what I'm saying, then it needs to get the precise syllables and the words, then link those words to sentences, then to paragraphs, then to this whole talk. So it has to abstract over time in order to build a model of everything that I'm saying. So you're doing this right now automatically very quickly in order to understand my speech. You also sit in the visual cortex and the auditory cortex with prediction errors in the context of the predictive coding. Um, so really uh, important to understand that this is a, this is a fundamental aspect of how the mind constructs our reality. So it's this process, process of abstraction that gives rise to everything that we experience, the rich sensory experience, all our emotional responses to the experience, our categorization of it, our ability to talk about it, all our relationships with it. This is one of my favorite spots in the um, uh, Italian Alps. Very beautiful. So recall now that I introduced these three styles of meditation, focused attention, open monitoring, uh, non-dual awareness, and then also this interesting thing called neurotisama party where it all, it all disappears. Obviously not very practical from an evolutionary uh, uh, adaptive survival perspective. Although there might be uh, one exception to, to that claim, which is maybe it re represents a kind of hibernation state. I won't go into that. Now, there's three more uh, concepts that I want to introduce to you that are part of this predictive processing view of the brain. Really important for understanding meditation. And the first one is precision weighting. Very interesting concept because this con concept unifies computationally our understanding of attention, the feeling of confidence, our sense that something is subjectively real, the idea that something really exists. And it's also a proxy, therefore, um, the degree of uncertainty that we experience, the expected uncertainty of anything that's happening in our mind. Now, to put this really simply, it's essentially that what which gives a sense of reality. It's what gives us our ability to actually perceive something as being there. When something has high precision, it's our brain saying, this thing is likely to be true given all our past experiences, therefore you should attend to it, give it, give it a sense of truth. Okay? And it's equated very closely also with attention because attention makes something real in, in, in a really deep sense according to precision weighting. Okay? Another concept is active inference. Now, active inference encapsulates all our actions, our ability to behave. It explains how through a process of prediction and minimization we actually move our bodies, why we move our bodies. And it accounts for mental actions, all our thoughts and inner simulations, also our physical actions. And the way that this works is I simulate internally a moment that is other than the now. And then I have prediction errors because that simulation doesn't exist right now. So my predictions are not being fulfilled. So reduce, to reduce the difference between that simulation and where I am now, I move my body. Okay? So I'm simulating... For example, the fact that I want a drink of tea because I have, have a bit of a itch in my throat because I've been talking. And so I simulate having that uh, tea and then I move my body to fulfill that simulation to reduce the prediction errors and take a cup of uh, a little bit of a drink. You see, so that's how movement is also encapsulated just through the simple process of reducing prediction errors. It's our inner simulation in this machine. It's our capacity to simulate realities that are not the present reality are not simply the data of our senses, but are, are, are simulations of the future, of the past. And then our, our capacity to fulfill those inner simulations is active inference. And this is a possibly a, a relatively uniquely human capacity or something that's at least evolved um, only in these creatures that are very quite complex, um, is this ability to create inner simulations. 
Now, the last thing I want to say about predictive processing is to describe levels of selfhood or levels of self. So there's this process of abstraction that creates everything that we experience, as I've already described. Now, this also can be dissected into three levels of selfhood, and, and many um, uh, uh, great uh, philosophers have, of mind have developed these, people like Sean Gallagher and Thomas Metzinger, and, they've, um, and also Kahneman talks about these, um, Daniel Kahneman. Um, and so at the top of this um, abstraction hierarchy is our narrative self. This, this is all our thoughts and ideas um, about ourselves in the past and our future. It's all, all the stories that I can tell about myself and where I've lived and who I think I am. And deeper than that in this hierarchy earlier is our experiencing self. It's, it's who we experience ourselves to be right now, how, how our body feels, um, um, what the sensory experience is like, how we are emotionally. It's our embodied sense of self, experiencing self right now. And even earlier than that experiencing self is just the fact that we're witnessing, we're, we're aware of our present experiencing self. So I'm also aware of my experiencing self. And on top of this experiencing self, I'm also aware of my narrative self. So even deeper, earlier on, we have this just... So, so <clears throat> subjectivity of, of witnessing in itself, it's kind of min, most minimal form of ourselves. So this is my use of the minimal. Minimal has been used in many different ways by different, uh, different scientists, but I think this is the, the simplest way to understand it. So you can see that our sense of self is actually this multi-layered. There's this basic level that we're just observing, that first-person perspective. But then there's also this embodied sense of myself in this present moment. And then there's also all of my stories about myself in the past and the future. So I could lose all my stories, but I would still have this sense of experiencing myself as a, as a body, as this present field of awareness, the one who's observing. But he, And I could also lose that, all of that, and then just have this still this sense of observation. So you can see how the observation is more fundamental the, than the embodied self and the thinking narratives about ourselves are even less fundamental. Okay, so now you've seen the levels of meditation. You have a sense of what we mean by the predictive brain as a process of prediction, error, might, minimization with all these different levels of self and abstraction. Um, and now I'm going to put this all together in our... Um, our theory of, of meditation. So recall this lay these layers of, of abstraction. And so to put it the most simply, what meditation is doing, so this is the most simple form of the theory that goes into way more complexity, um, but the most basic way to understand it is that meditation gradually, gently reduces this process of abstraction all the way from the abstract, coming down to the concrete and then beyond. So we go from the high levels of the mind, our thought processes, narrative self, down to our experiencing embodied self, and then we're even letting that go to witnessing itself and then beyond to this non-dual awareness. Okay, so now I'm going to put this in much more detail in terms of predictive processing, and you can see how this unfolds. And what was so shocking to me when I was writing this paper and trying to put these two things together, I sort of felt that they, they did cohere, but I just couldn't figure out exactly how they went together. But then I started to study these, the spectrum of meditation, think about my own experiences, think about all the different studies that have been done, the different findings there. And I was just shocked to find that this these meditation um, practices so beautifully cohered and and, and um, connected to this process of decreasing abstraction. And the most interesting thing is that this process of decreasing abstraction is really a process of bringing us deeper into the, into the here and now, from our most abstract to our embodied and even beyond that to witnessing and awareness. So recall now, focused attention, open monitoring, and non-dual. So here's how the model works. Focused attention, first what it does, it focuses our attention by increasing the precision of present moment sensory experience. So remember what precision is equivalent to attention, felt confidence, realness. So we make real, we give attention to some specific sensory content. Okay. And what this does is it brings us from the thinking narrative self into a um, through focused attention to a sensing, experiencing self. And this reduces abstraction in the brain. This reduces the think the tendency to think 
to mind wander that we're usually kind of caught up in this process of thinking and mind wandering and being lost in, in our minds. Then open monitoring um, decreases the evaluation and precision of sensory content through bare or unconditional observation. So what open monitoring does, it reduces our tendency to evaluate, to judge, to have any preference whatsoever. So focused attention still has this preferential attention to one thing against other things. And this is the important thing. This is the thing I want to observe. Whereas open monitoring really relaxes, lets go of even this judgment, even this preferential uh, treatment of any sensory experience. And this open monitoring, the Pasana practice, brings us to a sense of observation in general, a sense of open, open observation, and therefore decreases the uh, abstraction one layer further, less evaluation. Now, non-dual meditation finally deconstructs the distinction between subject and object. So by getting rid of meditation, getting rid of the meditator, getting rid of the sense of the observation, getting rid of the sense that there's any path, that, that you're trying to do anything whatsoever, completely empty, open, letting it all go, letting go of the body, letting go of experience, dropping attention to anything whatsoever, complete relaxation, non-attainment, non-meditation, no ambition, deconstructing the sense that there's an subject observing the, an object who is the subject? What is the subject? Where is the subject? All of this is let go is through non-dual practices. And then what can possibly arise through these conditions, by setting these conditions, through letting go even deeper, is letting go of this basic assumption that there is even a subject observing and an object. And what is revealed is a, um, a groundless ground of awareness. Now, there's another way I can put this um, process of meditation in terms of, the, in terms of time. So if you imagine someone who first sits on a cushion and their process going from focused attention all the way to non-dual um, state, you can see what this might look like. So for instance, here, I'm, I'm presenting three levels of abstraction in the mind, in the predictive processing hierarchy. Okay, And then you have time, the meditation process. And so this is what a mind-wandering state looks like. So the red dots are, the size of the red dots represent precision or attention. So this is going to be a little bit uh, technical, but stay with me if you can. So you can see at the highest levels in mind wandering, there's this attention to particular um, uh, thoughts that are arising at the highest levels of our mind. And these are what are capturing attention over time. Those are those red dots there. Okay, And then when one starts focused focusing attention to, for example, the breath, one brings that focused attention down to a deeper level, an earlier, not deeper, a lower, earlier level of, of experience um, in this, these layers of abstraction, and then keeps attention on that, um, that breath. And so you can see that at that middle level, you're still get, getting some of these task-related thoughts arising at that middle level, but then the meditator, because they're a very good meditator, simply brings attention back to that one object of meditation. So I'm explaining this figure in a very simple way, but you can see it in much more detail in the, um, in the paper. Then in open monitoring, the meditator lets go even of that object of meditation. So now you can see even those early levels of experience are let go of. So those little dots of precision become even weaker. They just fade into the background. They start to just disappear into the background. Then finally, in the non-dual state, the thing that becomes red, the, the thing that becomes precise, that the system alights upon, is actually the background that was always there in all of the levels, but now has the precision, is now the thing that becomes the foreground, the background becomes the foreground. Instead of attention being captured, instead of precision being captured by the whole field of experience, it's captured by the very background of experience, the very groundless ground underlying the all experience that was always present at every level of those experiences, as you can see by those, uh, those different rectangles there. So in this way, you can also see that this, this non-dual awareness was always there. It's always ever present, but it's, it needs this process of deconstruction for it to become noticeable in some cases. Okay, so now you have an idea of how this all comes together, how predictive processing and, and, and meditation um, cohere in this really um, um, 
I, I, I think, beautiful way. But now I'm going to describe some of the empirical evidence that supports this, this model. Now, there's a, a lot to review, um, so I'm just going to highlight some key pieces of evidence. Some of these, these concepts won't be familiar to all the listeners, but um, if you're, especially if you're a scientist, you'll, you'll recognize these. So focused attention. First thing we know from the literature is that focused attention reduces mind-wandering and rumination. Very simple. Of course, it reduces our tendency to think. That's, that's the most basic form of evidence for this focused attention, and that is our narrative self, our tendency to be caught up in thinking. So very simple. There's the evidence that um, there's a reduction from thinking to sensing. It also reduces activation of the default mode network in terms of fMRI studies. In, in particular, you see that um, the blood oxygen flow to our default mode, which usually represents our self-related um, ruminations, or that's at least one of the things it tends to be associated with, is reduced. Focused attention also increases neural markers of sensory prediction errors, which means that it's increasing the precision of sensory experience, which is exactly what I've claimed, that it's bringing the mind down from this narrative process of thinking by increasing the precision of sensory experience and thereby making it the uh, center of our experience. Open monitoring. So OM meditators show no reward-related prediction error response, which suggests that they're not expecting rewards. They're not thinking about what's about going to happen in the next moment. They're not judging things whether on, on whether they're good or bad. Now, you don't get this with focused attention meditators, but you do get this with open monitoring meditators, showing that there's a reduction in evaluation, deeper reduction in evaluation. We also found... Um, that following uh, an open monitoring retreat, meditators show reduced attentional blink and neural markers of temporally deep processing. Now, that's not going to mean much to some people, but what, what this means is that meditators are less captured by what's happening in the present moment, um, sensory changes in the present moment, because they're, they're more unconditional about what's happening. So they're more quickly able to capture what's happening in sensory uh, experiences and this is this is captured by a task called the attentional blink and it's evidence also by neural markers okay so this suggesting that meditators are less evaluative more uh, unconditional to sensory experience om also leads to better detection of unexpected stimuli whereas fa leads to better detection of expected stimuli similar thing less expectation more open OM meditation, but not focused attention, show consistent and relatively strong reductions up to 23% in pain intensity rating. So open monitoring, this openness reduces the intensity of pain, again, because there's less, less attachment, less identification, less, less conditionality um, to uh, present moment experience, less judgment. Now, non-dual. Very hard to study in the lab because you can't have people do anything in a non-dual state because they're... Um, you know, beyond all of all of that. Um, so there's very few studies about this and more research is needed, but just a few interesting studies. For example, smaller startle response during non-dual meditation relative to focused attention and control. So startle response is something very automatic. For example, when we blink to something scary happening, um, that's very hard to prevent the subtle muscles that make these movements. Um, and so you get the smallest, at least in one study, for uh, non-dual meditation compared to focused attention and, and control because non-dual meditation is so much deeper, so much further away from these, these sensory experiences, you could say, or at least kind of the reactivity to these sensory experiences. No habituation to the startle response in 12 non-dual meditators relative to control. So there's no habituation. There's no kind of learning happening, you could say there. And there's also neurophenomenological evidence that subjective selfless states are consistent with relevant reductions in neural activity. So when you see people go into these non-dual selfless states, you also see a reduction in neural activity in the places that you would ex expect those reductions in neural activity, because that's where those reductions are um, associated with processing of the self. So those areas have, you would see decreases and there's, there's many different areas of the brain associated with self-processing. Okay, so that's some of the evidence, and there's a lot more I could I could uh, go into um, about that. And I'll just make a little caveat here that you know not all these practices are safe. There's also a lot of um, research coming out, for, for example, from the from Jared Lindahl and Willoughby Britton that show that um, meditators uh, often undergo really difficult experiences going through these states, and and it needs to be done in a gentle way with guidance and with um, 
um, yeah, hopefully with a, with a good teacher and a good framework to be able to integrate these experiences that happen because very intense practice can lead to these enormous changes in the system which can not always be experienced positively, especially we can have negative reactions to the things that arise. And for example, the fear that we might disappear or these kinds of things. So I'm gonna conclude this part of the talk by raising this question. How can something as simple as being in the present moment be such a big deal because being in the present moment is annihilation to go deeper and deeper into the present moment is to actually deconstruct all of our experiences actually to essentially disappear is to go beyond all of experience our present moment is not just our sensory experience this is constructed through predictions from past experience so to go deeper and deeper into the present is is complete annihilation you know, but, but I want to say that, of course, meditation is not just about annihilation. It's not just about disappearing and, and you know, hanging out in this sort of void. You know, that, that, that seems completely impractical, both evolutionary. It's not helpful to anybody in the world. And so it needs to be something about something else. And one of those things that it's about, um, and it's about many things, it's about becoming a better human, becoming more compassionate. And, but one of the things that I've done a lot of study on is insight experiences, this sense that we can suddenly discover something new to make progress in our understanding of reality within. So we've all experienced these sudden experiences of insight or aha moments, eureka experiences. And so these are said to happen in meditation and some meditation techniques are even called insight meditation, like Vipassana, a very, very um, popular form of, of uh, meditation practice, especially in Theravada Buddhism. So I wanna give you a little ex experience of perceptual insight here. And you, you know, this isn't going to work for everyone, but it'll work for some of you. So what do you see here when you look at these bricks? Maybe you don't see much. Do you see anything at all besides anything at all besides bricks? What if you focus your attention a little bit to the center, center of this of this screen? Do you see anything there? What if I zoom in a little bit? Do you see anything there? Is anything coming out to you in your vision or is it just still bricks? Okay, and here, here's the key word I want to give you as you observe this. I'm going to say a word. And that word is cigar. Do you see a cigar now? So some of you, not all of you, will exp have be now seeing the cigar um, in, in the... Um, in the image, um, and those for you of you who for <laughs> those of you who don't see it um, now, ho hopefully this little highlight here helps. Or I can even zoom in and then bring it out for you there. Can you see it now? There you go. Okay, so this is a, just an example of how an insight can happen through seeing the same information in a new way. We can suddenly perceive something that we couldn't perceive just a moment before. Okay. And so in this predictive processing framework, we've developed a theoretical framework of, um, well, this was originally developed by Bayesian, I mean, by uh, Carl Friston, but we've taken this to the next level to also account for our really deep, profound sense of insight that we get. Um, and you can check out that paper. It's called the Eureka Heuristic. Um, but to understand how insights can arise through meditation, um, there's a technical term called Bayesian reduction, or fact-free learning. That is that the system can learn without new facts. That is fact-free. In a moment without gaining new information, the system works on itself to derive new ways of looking at reality. So this is a famous quote from Henry Poincaré, uh, a very famous math mathematician. He says that the genesis of mathematical creation is a problem which should in intensely interest the psychologist. It is the activity in which the human mind seems to take least from the outside world, in which it acts or seems to act only of itself on itself, so that in studying the procedure of geometric thought, we may hope to reach what is most essential in man's mind. So it's as if the mind is working um, of itself on itself to provide, find a better way of looking at reality, of, of a more concise and more parsimonious way of looking at reality. Hal Friston, who um, described this process of Bayesian reduction, and this is a little bit uh, technical, he said that Bayesian model reduction is a particular form of model selection that represents a top-down approach where alternative models are distilled from a full model 
much like a sculpture is revealed by the artful removal of stone. So making, by making our models simpler, more parsimonious, by crafting them within, they become more and more, um, um, uh, well, they become better. And, and by becoming better, they can induce a new way of seeing reality and through that give us an insight experience. So we're removing any outside influence. We're working on that inner model within, restructuring it, and through that gaining the insight experience. Now, that's one way, Bayesian model reduction, changing the way our models work. Another way is that by bringing attention, increasing the precision of lower levels of our predictive hierarchy, we allow that those lower levels to, dr to drive our model selection, drive the way that our models um, are informed um, and what they're based upon. So we're bringing our attention to our experience. We're bringing our attention to the nature of the self. We're bringing our attention to these really fundamental aspects of our mind. And by doing that, we're increasing their precision, and that is rewiring our models, and that can also give rise to new insights, to new ways of looking at reality, of new ways of experiencing ourselves. But you can also see that when, when the system goes to these states of non-dual awareness or neurota samapati, then you're also going beyond even the capacity to have insights in those states. Those states themselves are beyond even the, the capacity to experience insight. You know, but what can happen is that in the process of meditation, going in and out, in and out, and reobserving the phenomena from that perspective, insights can arise. Okay, thank you for staying with me this far. It's a, it's a lot of information. The last thing I want to say about insight is that, you know, just because we're having an insight doesn't mean it's true. We have a lot of false insights. Everybody's had false insights. All the conflicting ideas about reality um, and, and, and also, you know, mental illness, delusional beliefs, but everyone has false insights, sometimes believe something that isn't true. And a lot of my research, so these are all, all studies that I've, I've worked on through my PhD and beyond, I, I look at this issue of false insights as well. I think this is fascinating. And so I want to emphasize that meditation doesn't always just lead to true insights. That's not what I'm saying, but it does create conditions conducive to insight. And, I, and we, for example, shown, um, along with my student, Hilary uh, Grimmer, that we can even elicit false insights on reliably in the laboratory in people by setting up the conditions to make false insights happen. Um, and these are really um, hard to, to um, uh, stop having. You know, once the conditions for false insights are there, it just happens to you. And here, here, here's a good example of a false insight from uh, William James again. And this was on one of his nitrous oxide uh, trips. He said, the keynote of the experience is the tremendously exciting sense of an intense metaphysical illumination. Truth lies open to view in depth beneath depth of almost blinding evidence. The mind sees all the logical relations of being with an apparent subtlety and instantaneity to which its normal consciousness offers no parallel. Only as sobriety returns, the feeling of insight fades, and one is left staring vacantly at a few disjointed words and phrases. So even within our own experience, we can go through these profound experiences of insight, and then they're impermanent and they pass, and we're left without that sense of insight, without that sense of belief. Very interesting. Okay, so now you've made it to hear about the levels of meditation, about the predictive brain, probably the fastest description of the predictive brain that you've ever heard, as well as a whole theory of, of how this all goes together. And now we're going to get a little bit philosophical, go a few steps further, and let's see if you can come with me on this uh, little bit of a uh, bit more speculative journey into undoing the paradox of non-duality. So many people are interested in awareness. You know, is awareness the fundamental nature of reality? But what is pure non-dual awareness. What is that? Where does it come from? Now, I'm not going to answer that question exactly, but I'm going to give you some perspectives. So is, is, is awareness the nature of the universe? Is that the fundamental underlying reality before our material perception? Is it there before the experience of things? Is it there before the subatomic particles of physics? Is it the nature of the universe? 
Or is it just an illusion? Is it something that just is just constructed by our bi biology and it's not anything worth taking seriously? These are just fabricated experiences that some people have when they get themselves in these weird meditative states or they take psychedelics and trip out. You know, they have these, these wild experiences. Is it all just an illusion, a construction? Now, I don't want to propose that it's none or all of the above. I want, I want to just kind of break this, uh, break this duality. I want to present a neurophenomenological view of awareness. And I want to say that awareness is constructed, impermanent, and ultimately dependent on the conditions of our bi biology. I think this is evidenced by um, general anesthesia, um, neuroticism apart in meditation, comatose states, or perhaps even sometimes deep sleep where there isn't awareness present. There can be awareness present there, or we can be aware of that awareness present. But there does seem to be awarenesses somehow affected by our biology. But it is the primal inference, the first prediction, the basis of anything anyone has ever experienced. Without awareness, there is no thing to ever experience. No things even exist. And that's what makes awareness the most fundamental thing, extremely, extremely important in the domain of experience. All experience is dependent upon this one event being present. So to experience it directly perhaps relaxes our grasping for all other experiences. It allows us to be aware of the fundamental nature of the mind and therefore see that everything else is a movement. It's kind of like a movie, perhaps. But to become attached to the idea of it or even the experience of it is also perhaps a trap. Now, finally, how can an organism with a boundary exist in a non-dual way? in daily life. So I mentioned this boundary of the body that interacts with the world. So how can we have an experience of non-duality if this boundary between the body exists? Now, the important thing to understand is that that apparent world out there is not actually present. What's out there is this weird subatomic wavy particle field of stuff. Um, and we're just inside here and everything that every boundary that we perceive between our body and the world is just a predictive process so actually the whole idea of this box this boundary this world and the other people are all happening um, and this whole hierarchy of of predictive processing is all happening within awareness so all of the boundaries all of the hierarchies all of the concepts all of these things as we experience them, are happening on the background of awareness. Every separation, everything is happening on the background of this uh, awareness. And so you can see how this non-dual awareness actually permeates through mind-wandering, focused attention, open monitoring, all these different states of meditation. And I would just want to say a few things, and these are just kind of contemplative things that you can take with you um, to, con to consider and think about. To talk about something existing outside awareness is to make a thing in awareness. A thing needs a perspective that separates it from other things. To make a thing, you need a perspective on that thing that separates that statistical regularity from all the other things. You need to somehow take a perspective. There would be no separating a tree from the ground without a perspective to take that, that uh, position. You need a perspective to create a thing. And if you need a, need a perspective to create a thing, perspectives also require awareness. Okay? So you need awareness to have a perspective and you need a perspective to have a thing. Okay, so this is why awareness, although perhaps conditioned and, and contingent about on some biological uh, uh, conditions, is still extremely fundamental because there are no things. There are no things without awareness. So I conclude with this. There may be stuff, but there ain't no things. Uh, thank you so much for making it this far uh, through my presentation. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that gives you some sense of, of, of the true nature of now as I've come to see it and, and how all of these different meditation techniques come together and can be understood through the lens of the predictive brain. Huge thank you to Professor Helene Slagter um, and many other people who have helped put these, these ideas um, together. And if you want to check out my website or stay in touch, you can go there. It's just rubinlaukonen.com. Uh, uh, thank you so much.
And thank you so much to the Theosophical Society also for, for inviting me to, to, to present this, this information to you. Well, I hope you enjoyed that presentation by Ruben. It's amazing research that he is doing. I'd like to invite you to join us again Thursday next week when we will have Dr. Donna Golding speaking on the nature of inspiration, a psychological, spiritual, and theosophical perspective. In the meantime, I hope that you will be safe and well, and I look forward to seeing you next week. Good night to you all.